Hey everybody, it's Deja Vu. Hello, my name is Bardic Dice. We're back and we're heading up our second part of the night, the interview with Megan. How you doing tonight? Good. Hey. Doing good, doing good. Uh, nailed it the first time with production uh, as we do every time. Uh, but thank you guys, welcome back. Uh, we are just starting the recording for YouTube. So if you did not watch us live, we do stream this. Wednesdays at 7 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitch if you want to join us. But tonight we are doing our Call of the Nether Deep, uh, Road to the Nether Deep interviews. Uh, since we'll be starting this campaign in July, I wanted to go ahead and pull back the screen a little bit and get to know our players better. I think sometimes we focus on the characters and the story so much that people don't get to know the actual players behind it. So I'm super excited to have you, Megan. Amara, uh, you know. <laughs> Whichever um, works. Whichever works. Yeah, I've, I always say Greg and Amara, and it's like, it's so hard to get that uh, disconnected now, but we'll work on it, so. It's uh, okay. But uh, yeah, why don't you um, shout out any social medias you got going on, or any projects you want, or anything? Um, I got a lot of projects in the work. I just don't have anything set in stone yet. So in the meantime, I guess you can follow me on Instagram, same name, Amara Vaxelin. Um, I usually post like D&D recaps there or D&D terrain stuff or minis I paint or dice making. So if I do anything, I'll post it there. Definitely go give her a follow. Uh, her and Greg are amazingly talented and I just love all the stuff that you create. I mean, look at their, look at your background. Your background is amazing with all the characters and stuff. It's so neat. I love it. I need to have you come over and help me with this mess back here. It's, <laughs> it's rough. Uh, but before we get into our interview, a quick little uh, um, kind of recap of it. So we will be starting in July, July 6th. Uh, we put the dates in stone. We're going to be doing uh, our first uh, episode. It's going to be more of a one shot because uh, I want to show off the rivals. Something special about Netherdeep is that it's got a rival group of characters that um, also is trying to become adventurers and protagonists in their own stories so you're gonna have some uh surprises for that game it's gonna be really fun to kind of interact with them see who they are and then starting the next week we'll do our player intros and you'll get to see where they are started just like we did for fate so I have like our 0.5 sessions and then in the in the end of july we'll start our actual uh the whole party coming together so super excited for everyone to check that out however we do have a little trailer, so let's go ahead and roll that so you guys can see what to expect in this upcoming Call of the Netherdeep. But you get when you get a five second name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, we are super excited to bring this to you. I'm a big Critical Role fan. Um, so having them come out with a module campaign to play has just been my just super duper fun uh, dream to do. I think it'd be great. However, uh, don't worry. I know a lot of people here are not critters or have not watched the Critical Role content. You will not need to know anything prior uh, to understand the storyline here. We're going to make sure anything that you would need to know, I'm gonna explain it as if you're brand new watching it. Um, so it is gonna have little tie-ins or maybe Easter eggs or just like knowing the world. Uh, but as far as um, like direct tie-ins, uh, then we're going to limit that a bit, or at least I'm gonna explain them to you as we play along. So 
that being said, uh, I'm super excited. Uh, we'll have, as you saw, Nick and Brittany are returning uh, to the screen from our last campaign. But Megan, you are one of our newer players alongside Greg. Um, mm. Are you excited to play? I'm excited to meet your character. Who is your character that you'll be playing? A little, you know, teaser with it. We don't want to give away too much, but uh, how did you come up with the name and uh, who you're playing? Um, as far as the name, what happened was, I think it was before your one shot, you were working on like the promo for this and you were like, Megan, I need your character name. And I literally just walked in the door from like work and I was like, oh crap, I forgot to give him that. So it's literally the first thing that I thought of off the top of my head and I stuck with it. So her name's Selenia. Selenia. And then Selenia. i have to get that. And, um, hmm. She's, can I tell what race and class she is or you want that a secret? Uh, keep the class secret, but you can go ahead with the race if you want. Because people will probably so see artwork beforehand, so. Yeah, so she's going to be a pallid elf, which is Matt Mercer's kind of own uh, version of an elf that ties into his world. Uh, I picked it because it, they have all black eyes and I was just sold. I wanted to be someone just with aesthetics. like... Yeah. <laughs> just sold 100% on the aesthetic and then I was like I'm gonna make this work like we're gonna do it so that's what I'm gonna be um do you want to tell people about the paladels a little bit because they are newer to the setting versus like Forgotten Realms um about kind of their hist like a brief history of you know what's so special about them versus other elves so pallid elves have like a uh, pasty white skin and very like white blonde hair um the reason for that is because they were driven underground so where sunlight's not going to get them that's why they're so pale and they kind of come in to the story more around campaign two kind of the end of campaign two where there was a war that happened and then they started kind of venturing out into the world from under the ground to try and see what's going on kind of thing um and then without too many other spoilers uh uh yeah she makes her way out into the world I'm mad for I'm some reason same exact time <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes we we both so. have uh for sure added in some backstory stuff to uh give reasons for that but uh yeah if you're if you're at all um used to um the critical role setting uh Jorhas and the Kryn dynasty is basically the drow um in this world so the paladels are kind of the cousins of drow they're kind of drow but in a different region and, and went in hiding for a different reason so they are relatives and so you can kind of relate that to uh that just different lore i guess you could say uh so a lot of questions i've been seeing and i've had in a while i think you've explained it to me a couple times personally but where did amara vaxelin come from because for a lot for a long time since you've been in the chat for a while since we started fates and everything and even before that Everyone has thought your name is Amara. I mean, I still go <laughs> Greg and Amara, so it's Megan. But where did Amara yes. come from and how'd you come up with that name? So Amara was my first ever D&D &D character. Okay, second D&D &D character, but the first one I ever played. Fair enough. Um, she was a elven rogue. All her friends, aka my party members, called her an elf with a death wish. So you hate elves uh, is what I'm getting along uh, with this. No, more like I, I decided to build a rogue and play her as a tank, and she had an 11 in her constitution. So Fair enough, fair enough. I figured as my first character ever, Khan was a dump stat. Why would I need Khan? So. <laughs> That's, I used to think like that, too, to be honest. And I was like, mm, right? no one ever rolls Khan saves. Why do I need this? And then it took I, me a while to realize it's, it's connected to your hit points. Yeah, so some bad choices later. I think she died like three times in the campaign. <laughs> but I needed an Instagram name because I was going to start posting like recaps of our game. Because I, mm. okay, so I used to follow Rachel on Instagram and she would post updates of her like campaign with Ave. Mm. And then I was like, I love this. I want to do this with my campaign. So I would post like pictures of all the terrain and the minis that we did and like. Greg would put these full out battles and games together. So I just post them that way. And uh, that's how Amara came to be. <laughs> and then I just stuck with it for everything on the internet. I think it's so fun that like a lot of our community, myself included, all came around uh, a lot of it because of Hip's uh, updates and D&D &D stuff. Or we started getting commissions and getting to know her. And then now we've all kind of like cross connected within the tavern. 
Uh, so that's amazing. I think it's really cool that um, a lot of you guys have been able to see the growth of the characters too over so long. I mean, it's been five, six years since those characters were around, but that's like the connection yeah. form. I think that's, I don't know, that's that's really cool because you don't see that in normal like Adventure League D&D &D or, you know, stuff like that. Like if, you know, or in real life being able to say, oh, my first D&D &D character is, is how I met this person. So. I don't know. I think it's super cool. I love it. Um, yeah. Well, that's how I was brought into the community, right? For sure. For sure. And we're glad that you're here and now playing in my game. We're super honored and lucky. Um, so, kind of breaking down the DM screen behind Amara Baxlin, who you are as a person. We'll start off with uh, kind of the same thing, kind of same format we did the last time. And chat as well. If you guys have any questions that you want to jump in and ask, feel free to post them in chat. We can ask them as well. Um, but Amara, or Megan, <laughs> I'm going to do this all night. See? It happens. Uh, so that's how you met Pip. That's how you got into our community here at the Tavern. But what about your life growing up? Give us a little example and, and insight into that. Did you, you know, what was your family set up like? Do you have brothers and sisters? And was like gaming ever a part of that growing up? Um, so my family, I have a single mom, or at least I say she's single because my dad kind of, not to get like too deep off the beginning, sure. but my dad kind of left us when we were 11 and was in and out, kind of not really there. So my mom's a single mom. It was me and my two younger sisters. And so my mom was always really big on my sisters and I being friends getting together, doing things together. So she really kind of inspired us to like be creative, be kind, be strong women. And so that's kind of how I got into like so many of my hobbies mm -hmm. and into gaming, not specifically like video gaming, mm -hmm. but board games were very big to my mom. Okay. So every year for Christmas, she would always buy us a family board game and we play it every Christmas. Oh, that's so fun. So that's kind of like a tradition with my family. Yeah. And ever since then, like even now that Greg and I are married in our own house, we always get a board game every year for Christmas. That's so cool. So that's something you guys have in common then. You guys both grew yeah. up around board games and that's just a yeah. common occurrence. That's so neat. Yeah. That's that's not at all <laughs> common in my family. We're like, board games, <laughs> no. what's that? They play like the old card, like Pinochle. Like, that's what we played, you know, that kind of stuff, which as a kid, I'd be like, I don't know what's going on at all. That's <laughs> so cool. So that's also where you got your creative side then as well. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So my mom used to do like art all the time. She loves crafts. Like she's always said, if we have grandkids, that's all she's ever going to do is do crafts with them. Like she's just waiting for the day for one of us to have a kid. <laughs> and so like she's just day one, always been that person that's like, Oh, you want to draw? Go ahead. Oh, you like writing? That's fine. Mm -hmm. Like really in like promoting my creative interests because that was something I wasn't getting elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of nice to have that. No, it's okay. Arts are okay. You right. can do them as like a profession. You can do them as an interest. You don't have to be good at math, good at science. Because I wasn't. I sucked at them yeah. really badly. Boo math, lame. <laughs> Can't wait but for then some she's of our, our, our people in chat be like, "Hey, <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> like that's, that's literally what D and D's based around is math. Like, back off. <laughs> I don't do the math. I look at Greg, and Greg does the math on the dice for me if it's too much. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I don't it's know. So there's that, though. and then I also did like a lot of sports as a kid too, which mm -hmm. most people are really surprised at. But I did. What kind of I sports? Did baseball. I did baseball, both house league and competitive, and then I did baseball and volleyball. Yeah, volleyball, me too. Let's go. Yeah. Fun. We can do a tavern volleyball team. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll just cross the border. Yep. I was actually surprised because, yeah, I played um, soccer uh, and baseball growing up. A little flag football because they wouldn't let me actually play, like, tackle football. Uh, but then our friends were playing volleyball and I'm like, I can't do volleyball. And like, I sucked at everything else, but man, I could serve <laughs> for whatever yeah. reason. It just clicked like the motion. Right? I think it was like football throwing or something like that. And so I became a really good, uh, like server and then kind of learned everything else with the rotation. So that's, that's really fun. That's actually cool. Cause I, I feel like that's kind of, um, not typically associated with like the gaming nerd world is like having that sports background as well. I did everything. Mm -hmm. I was musical theater. Like I was just, my hand was in every cookie jar. 
I love it. I love it. Just because of, like, um, because he wanted to try out different stuff, or was it, you know, like trying to go for education stuff, or like what was kind of pushing you to to join all these different things? I'm just like a Jill of all trades. I like to know a little bit about everything. Mm. So I like, like my parents started me off in t-ball when I was a kid and then I just loved it. So I stuck with it. And then school sports are like, oh, do you want to join the volleyball team? I was like, of course I do. Like, let's try this out. So just, I wanted to try everything and anything. I'm just a very curious person. And yeah. if you know me, I have a million hobbies. So it started young. That's really cool. I think that's that's awesome that it kind of stayed with you through that whole time as well. So what about your exposure to gaming growing up then? So you had board games and I had board that games. creative side. What about video games or like the other nerd culture stuff? How did you get exposed to that? And was that even exposure growing up to you? Video games I wasn't allowed to have in my house, period. My dad was adamant that we were never allowed to have video games in our house. And the first video game console I got was when I was like 18 and he had moved out and we just, I was just like, heck yeah, video games yeah. are a thing now. I'm like, reveling, I, I got Sonic. Like, <laughs> Right? And it's so funny cause like Greg and my friend will make fun of me because they're like, oh, you're a gamer. And I'm like, no, I'm not a gamer. I'm not. Like I refuse to admit I'm a gamer for the sole fact that like a gamer to me is that kid that was like four years old playing Mario. Right. Like, and has played it their whole life. Whereas I came into it so late. Interesting. Sort okay. of thing. But I remember my mom's friend's son had an N64 and every time we used to go to his house, yeah. like we didn't care about visiting them. Yeah. We just were like, I get to play Mario Kart and Goldeneye? Heck yeah, Heck like yeah, this is bro. great. Yep. <laughs> so that was just about to ask, what was your first video game that like you remember being like obsessed with? Mario Kart. Mario Kart, nice. Yeah, like whenever we went to his house, it was like, cause we could play multiple people, right? right and it was yeah. like my, mm -hmm my sister and I and him, so uh, we could okay. both play video games. Did so. you ever do the, since you're the older sister, did you ever do the unplugged controller thing to your sister? Or was she like old enough to understand? My sister's more like put together than I am. Okay. Like she's like, she's the one that like, I'm not gonna say she would bully me, but like she's the tougher of the two of us. <laughs> okay, like I was okay. the pushover. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So she, so she knew how to, to control the, the, the space and get what she wants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so you kind of went over sports then as well. So these video games, what about other hobbies that you have outside of D&D or TTRPGs like growing up? Was there, like, what was kind of your big stuff doing that? Uh, I liked sewing. Mm. So I got into that in high school, which got me into cosplay, which then got me into like where I'm working right now at a fabric store. Um, but I also like drawing. I like painting. I like musical theater and all that kind of worked with the sewing too because i do the costumes for that um yeah that's kind of what i did like as that's a cool. kid mm -hmm. for hobbies you got into theater um and, I, in, and high school, in high school yeah i it's so funny i think a lot of people that gravitate to D, &D i think especially the role-playing side uh come from a theater background because that improv and acting sort of Background. But it's funny because I didn't do that part of theater. Well, that's right. Well, I was, so you did more I was behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> so my high school boyfriend was like the tech crew. Uh -huh. And so I do okay. like the lighting and the sound. And then I did the backgrounds and the costumes and all that kind of stuff. I was never an actor. Okay. At all. So but the role play aspect of D&D is my favorite part. Yeah. That's fun. So do you think you picked up anything from watching people perform or just the appreciation for it? Or was that just mainly because of that creative outlet for you? I love the storytelling aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Like, and I like watching people interact and having those moments where like, it might just be off the cuff improv or something like that. But like the connections that they would have together were like, great. You get so many jokes out of it, so many laughs, but that's what you can bring into D&D, &D, which I find interesting. I love that. That's cool. But what about D and D, and specifically tabletop RPGs? Was um, like, how did you get exposed to Dungeons and Dragons or another tabletop? Was Five E or D and D your first exposure? No. So I can't remember what edition was out. Probably fourth edition um, when I was in high school. But I remember my one of my good friends at the time. Her boyfriend would come over. He like lived in a town away, and so he'd make a trek out. 
and he would always tell us how cool his D&D games were with his friends and all that kind of stuff. And so we were like, can you please run a game for us? Like, oh, I want to, because my friend was obsessed with Lord of the Rings at the moment, and we were all, like, really into elves and stuff. So we're like, please run a game for us. Please run a game for us. You and elves? I, I would have never guessed that that's a, Crazy. That's a thing there. That's Crazy. <laughs> it's like D&T flings. <laughs> but... <laughs> Called out. All right. Yeah. That's like okay. Mandrel. I love tieflings <laughs> just as much. <laughs> I have a tiefling thing. But, yeah, so he came over one time, and I, like, looked at the books i'm making this character i like elven of course she was an elf she was a bard her name was ilnenya that's why i say she was my first character okay. but i never got to play her because they were too busy making out with each other to actually like no. make a game of it really? so i was like come on like can we please just like focus on the fact that i need to know what oh, a good elf stats are frustrating <laughs> so that never happened and then fast forward to like greg said last week D and diesel um, okay. We saw it on YouTube, and then we were like, hey, so when I was a teenager, I really wanted to play D&D, and I never could, and he was like, well, I'm interested in it, so we asked our friends, and they all had the same experience where they were like, oh yeah, like, I've been interested in it, but I never knew people to play with it. And we're like, perfect, let's go, 12 of us, it's gonna happen. Boom. Boom. <laughs> I think it's so amazing. Okay, so both of you kind of really dove in after the D&D Diesel then. Yeah. I mean, I think one day we're going to have to meet Vin Diesel. I think he is our, you know, <laughs> secret uh, starter of the tavern. I don't think he realizes the inspiration yeah. indirectly. <laughs> we all think it's Critical Role. Nah, it's Vin Diesel. We'll yeah, nah, it's Vin Diesel. We'll here. <laughs> yep. That's how he gets you. So you all have to go now support Fast and Furious movies because of it. <laughs> no. Never. Actually, I really like, what was it? It, was, it wasn't The Witcher. There was... There's a movie that it came out during that time. I think he was promoting, and that where the blood hunter came from. Oh yeah, it was a. I forget what movie it was, but he was. It was essentially kind of like a, a witcher hunter. character. Essentially, yeah, he was like a. a oh, hunter, there you go, right? witch hunter. Witch hunter, yeah. Yep. That's actually a semi decent movie. <laughs> it was a fun one, but I think it was really cool that like Matt took that and made the blood hunter out of it. So if you guys actually heard from it that you would get that. So I thought it was actually kind of cool. From D&D made into a movie. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. So it's kind of the opposite. That's really fun. Uh, awesome. So other than D&D &D then, um, as it was alluded to a little bit last week, what other TTRPGs have you played? And is was it because of your love for D&D &D that got you into other stuff? Yeah, so it was definitely because of D&D &D that I branched out into other things. Um, I have a friend that's very into, like, testing out a million different TTRPGs. Oh, and, like, I'll make a character for every single one, and I learn everything, and then I never play it, yeah. or I play, like, one game in it. <laughs> so, like, as far as, like, playing TTRPGs, I'd say it's just, like, D&D &D, mm -hmm. uh, and Ten Candles, but I've also done, like, Fate Core... I've done our friend's like made up D6 kind of okay. system he's done. And then I've also done, I've created a character for uh, Starfinder and I've created a character for Savage Worlds. And you know, you, you created a character for City of Mist and, and never played that. So, oh, that's I mean, true, that's yeah, true, I forgot about that. Yeah, there's City of Mist. <laughs> That's I part create of it too. all the characters. I just don't play the games. That's my it's whole so life. Sad. I'm sorry. <laughs> one day, one day, it's still in my in my back of my mind that I'd like to bring it back up at some point. But yeah, cool. So what about Ten Candles then? Because um, if you want to talk about, it, I know it's a big game for you. You showed us during GaryCon. We kind of alluded to it with Greg last week, but I thought it was a really fun game, and I thought especially for the narrative side of games, which sounds like, you know, you and I are both kind of from that same thread of a D&D &D player. Uh, what is Ten Candles? Can you explain that for people who haven't heard of it? So Ten Candles, I, I know they say D&D &D is a cooperative storytelling game, but like Ten Candles literally is a cooperative storytelling game. Like there's nothing else to it other than it's you and a group of people telling a story. Um, it's a tragic horror story game. So it's not like 
you play the game and you can win. There's there's no winning in this game. The tragedy part of it is your character will always die at the end. So it's not for everyone. I it like can I get really win. dark. That's just me. But oh god, your character, no <laughs> way. Your <laughs> character was awful. My character was the worst. <laughs> the worst human being in history. But uh, yeah, so you as long as you go into the game knowing that your character will die and no matter what you do, it you can give yourself all the ammo in the world. You can give yourself all the rations in the world. It doesn't matter. You will inevitably die in the end. Then you can play like the coolest game. So it has a timer built into it, which is literally 10 tea lights. That's why it's called 10 candles. And so you sit in a dark room. This game is played in pure darkness. And the only light coming from it is those 10 candles. So like automatically aesthetics, like I love it. And I, I'm a mood setter. I'm that person that for D&D games, I'm going to light candles and set the lighting and like all that kind of stuff. I like sensory things. Mm -hmm. And Same so, yep. yeah. And so when you have those moments where the lights start going out, but people are burning their cards and you get that bright flash of light, it's like a glimmer of hope. Oh, it just gives, like, I still, I have chills right now. This game, I just love it sort of thing. So I'll talk about it till I go blue in the face and I won't talk about it all night. But I love this game. Give it a shot. The other thing is as a GM, it's the easiest thing. They come with pre-modules and you don't even have to. You just, you essentially need a hook and that's the only prep you need. I was going to say, it seemed like you really, it was more improv and reactive off of our mm -hmm. suggestions more than anything. Yeah. Oh, that was really cool. Yeah. Oh, that's really neat. So, and it's, it's something that's hard to like hear and understand of like, like when I'm going to die, like why would I want to do like, that doesn't sound fun. It is so much fun, um, especially playing off of your other people, like having them offer up a suggestion and you right after either like nope i'm gonna shoot that down or like give something to give our characters an obstacle or aid us i think it's really fun to see both sides of that happen because in dnd very rarely do you fail on purpose i think you can be like chaotic and kind of go for something knowing yeah, this is probably gonna go bad but you're not failing on purpose and i thought that was a really cool aspect to be like oh let's just see what happens if i press the red button and yeah you know Add in this well, Greg's care. Greg will always, when you're telling truths, will always throw something awful in there. He's like, mm. a fog sets in. We Our car runs out of gas, this and that. And everyone's like, why would you do that? That's an awful thing. And you're like, just you wait. Greg's setting you up for a good story. I mean, Greg was behind everyone turning on my character, so... It, you know, it's true. It's... <laughs> That's awesome. No, yeah, I would love to see if we can actually bring 10 candles to a stream. I think that'd be really, really fun. Um, and see how that would play out um, on a stream and kind of maybe even like incorporate that into the overlay as like an overlay gets darker and darker like a vinaigrette. You don't worry. I've already started playing. Yeah, this is fun. I, I would love <laughs> to see that and I would love to be part of that too. That'd be so cool. Uh, perfect. So heading back to D&D &D, then, of course, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, that's what this interview is about is, is you playing Dungeons & Dragons within Nether Deep as well. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do in D&D? I think we just talked about roleplay a little bit, but what's what's your favorite aspect of it? Um, I like to deep delve, deep dive into characters. Like, I love to create the smallest little details about characters that will never come to light. No one will ever know this about characters, but like, I know it and it makes me happy. <laughs> 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 like it's it's the stupidest thing because like really it, oh, it you sound just like Rachel and her Celeste character. <laughs> yeah, like I'll like do um, like I have to figure out what their outfits are, what their favorite food is, how many siblings they have, what their parents are like, because like that to me helps me role play because I can figure out okay like if you're an only child how are you going to react to this, but if you're come from a family of seven how are you going to react to this, right? So it helps me okay. deep dive into the character to then be able to role play it live in the game. That makes sense. Yeah, because uh, I, I know like um, Dealey is a lot like that. I remember her telling me like all this stuff about Meikai that I'm like, and watching how Meikai in, in uh, role plays with the other characters, I'm like, man, some of this stuff I don't think will ever, but like could potentially not even come up. But like you said, it's important for setting up that character so they know how to play it. So that's really interesting because I'm, I'm not like that. I have a hard yeah. time when people give me a whole list of like, well, who's Renan's family? And like, who are they? I'm like, I, I don't know. I it, To me, it's a blank slate until it comes relevant in the story or like I'm handing it over to the DM because 
I don't want my expectations to be different from theirs. So it's it's so interesting to see like that opposite formation of a character and how yeah. they all play. It's just really neat to see how you come with that. So I'm excited because you and I sat down about your your backstory and your character. Um, and what I thought you know, was, I go into yeah, a lot of into stupid detail. You'll really never want. <laughs> but I don't think it was. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's stupid. I think it's enlightening. And it gives me as a DM a lot of hooks to add to it. Where it's like, I think there's certain things you're like, oh, this will never come up. And I'm like, oh, just wait. It's going to be like the perfect dagger in the side moment for you guys. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's really, really fun. Um, which I, I actually had a lot of fun doing that because kind of like with Fate's group, when they, because like I was kind of having trouble figuring out how people are going to tie together. And I was like, why would you guys help each other? Then as soon as people start giving me backstories, I'm like, oh, perfect this goes with this perfect like you guys did the same exact thing here so it's i'm yeah. super excited to i like that and just like before you guys will have those intro sessions so getting a chance to see something that normally we wanted in a campaign if we didn't start early i think would be really cool so the audience will know a lot of stuff that the other characters might not know for a long time so that's i'm so excited for that that's what i'm i'm just so excited i'm excited for you to, to have the same thing of like you don't know what's going on for a while i know too that'd be really cool i'm excited this will be fun <laughs> so a little teaser for all of you guys you definitely don't want to miss the intro for uh greg and megan's characters it'll be fun uh so uh what about something you've never done in D D, but you've always wanted to i love this question uh complete a campaign that sounds so sad, but like I've never finished a campaign. Like I've never really? had closure for any of my characters. Mm. Amara scheduling just killed the campaign. Like, mm. and then my first Brielle one, COVID hit. Like I've just never finished an actual game, wow. and I'm excited to like play this module because I know there's an ending to mm. it. Like I, there's no way that this will not end. So getting closure. Knock on wood. I think, yeah, knock on wood. <laughs> Well, CNN, guys, but... Bardic Dice is retired <laughs> two episodes into Call of the Nether Deep. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I'm just excited to have like closure for a character for once, which is really exciting. That's super exciting. Yeah, because I remember um, you and I were actually talking about Brielle for that exact reason. Hmm. Uh, but potentially it was like, I know you're so attached to that character and not yeah. giving her a finale. But I can also get, you've also had so many iterations of her. Yeah. That, because yeah, I've, tr I've tried to play her so many times and it never ended. Mm. I was lucky that my DM currently was like, screw it. I love Brielle. I love like Greg's character. Even if the the game shop's not going to let me run this game, I'm going to finish this game for you because oh, I love them. And I was so like, oh. Fun. Do you think yeah. that game might end before we finish up with this module? Uh, Yeah, he's thinking probably end of July. Oh, We're God. close to finishing it, so... I guess I'll be your second. It's fine. But it's I'm... okay. It's okay. You get the other exciting thing about my character. That's like, true. things I've never done. That's fair. That's fair. I'll take that. <laughs> no, I think it's so cool. I mean, I mean, that was kind of the same thing for me before I kind of joined this group and we did um, Skyrim and Star Wars and now that we're into Beacons and we ended Wild uh, Witchlight. I mean, those are some of the first times I've ever DM'd a complete campaign. So getting to run in here and, and do this again. I think this would be super fun. Actually, I'm super excited about this more than Witchlight. I know it sounds weird. Witchlight, as much as I loved it, happened so quickly that and I wasn't expecting it to be a thing. It was like, I oh, will just do this for fun, whatever. Whoever shows up, shows up. So like, it was purely reading out of the book, right? Whereas yeah. this is like how I like to DM. I like to really deep dive backstories and, you know, add that into the book and add that into the module. So. I'm super excited that you get to experience that. It's fun. Um, e. Yay. Awesome. Well, what about a pet peeve or thing you dislike to experience in D&D? Whether it's other people at the table or maybe something about D&D that you find is flawed? Um, I don't... I I know a lot about D&D, but I don't know enough about it to criticize if it's flawed or not. That's but the fair. one thing I don't like, and I played with this in our first group, was people telling me how to play my character... So I had one guy that we played with and like I we were building characters for a new campaign, which again I played three games and then it ended. But um 
I was like, oh, I'm going to play a character with 20 charisma. And he was like, oh, perfect. You can be the face of the party. And I was like, my character doesn't really speak. And he's like, what? Like, how can you be, how can you have 20 charisma, but not speak? And I'm like, well, I mean, she's had some past trauma. She doesn't talk to people. She's very reserved and she's stunning. She's absolutely beautiful. And like, you would go out of your way to maybe approach her, but she doesn't really talk. And like, he couldn't get over that at all. Like he was just like, laying into me about it or like um there's a i like to set weird parameters on characters that are not mechanically there yeah. i just do it myself Thanks. so like i've done it before where like i've literally made material components required for all my spells even if they don't require them in the game oh, interesting. it fit with the character yeah. um but with brielle for me, her radiant consumption doesn't make sense to just be like, oh yeah, radiant consumption. Like, it, it makes no sense that she'd like all of a sudden just start burning glowing and yeah. radiant energy and all that. So I literally like wrote down very specific parameters in which this would trigger. Interesting. And it would only trigger if this happened. And then he was just like, well, why wouldn't you use this? And yeah. I'm like, because it makes no sense to her character. Yeah, but it's a mechanic and right. you should be using this. Yeah, it's yeah. handy. And I was like... Stop telling me how to play my own character. <laughs> back off! This is my person. Yeah, back off! It's my person. I one hundred percent agree. I think that's it's so true. So many people, um, and, and it's not a bad thing, but are, are, I think go so much forward with mechanics first that they tie everything else to their character around that. So when they see something like you or me playing a character, where it's like, oh no, uh, yeah, I have a twenty charisma, but it's because it's intimidation. It's not like a face of the party. It's like, but yeah but no you have the plus eight you should be you should be rolling here i'm like why i he didn't say anything like yeah yeah that's so cool i i am but then i i did about that oh sorry no good i was gonna say but then i'm the jerk that is like i don't want to say well it's what my character would do because like there's that whole stigma around that but like mm. it's what my character would do <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but i think done in the right Whoa. way yeah is is well i mean if, if you're doing it because it makes sense for your character and not because it's a selfish way that I think arms the group's agenda and the other players at the table. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, that's... I, I'm excited. I'm excited to see how you might play that into this character. Um, because... Reasons. <laughs> because... So spoilers. different. <laughs> she is so different from any character I've played. So I'm really excited. so excited about this character. Yeah, this is... Uh, one of the first ones that I got back for backstory, and so I really had to sink my my brain into it to make things work. Because I think that's a, one big thing for me. I mean, you guys who have been here since Fates um, was like, I wanted it. I didn't want to do the whole tavern scene. I want to do something totally unique. And so, trying to find out how the group comes together and stays together, and then kind of trust each other so early on, and especially a module where I think things ramp up a little earlier and faster than maybe a homebrew campaign could um that's been interesting to figure out with how different your characters are how to do that so i'm excited to see the actual interactions that you guys bring into it and um do it in a natural way because I, I trust all of you guys not to force things i don't think any of you guys are players were like oh well my character wouldn't do this but i'm going to force us working together mm. sort of thing you know yeah I'm excited. I'm excited. Thank you. Um, so with that then, um, do you prefer DMing or playing with D&D? &D? Uh, with D&D, &D, uh, player all the time. Okay. Um, only because every year for Greg's birthday, because he's our forever DM. So every year for his birthday, I would run a one shot, which would turn into a two shot um, <laughs> as his birthday gift. Right. But then I soon learned after my first experience that don't ever run a game with Greg in it. Cause like you can't, you can't, and but even wait, start that's to what I'm doing. Yeah, I know. So sorry um, about that. <laughs> I feel bad for I you. I saw the one shot. I'm like, he is joining one of my games one day. This is yeah. <laughs> so like he played, and he said last week, Arjun, his dragonborn who escaped from the nursing home and had Alzheimer's, like. 
That was what he came to the table That's with for so my good. first time ever. And then I stupidly decided to do a gotcha game in my game where there was like a curio cabinet and there was like a wizard who had an imp named Kevin. And he was like this little fat, like loincloth imp that hated his life and would give everyone the finger and like did not want to retrieve items, but uh. you pay money and he would begrudgingly go and grab it and give you the item. And Greg Jeez. got a wand of wonders. And I just died because he was like casting things like in battle, he got 500 butterflies to appear <laughs> and then forgot about it because his Alzheimer's or like what he are these summoned, butterflies here for? <laughs> right. Or he summoned like 20 pink toads that when you touch them, they turn into a monster. Well, didn't the old man touch a toad? And then here I am never having DM'd before opening the monster manual flipping through trying to find something on the spot oh, I so finally that. i was like it's a night hag because they can bamf out of existence and go to a different plane i'm not dealing with this <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah definitely a player nice. because uh greg's just a lot <laughs> i love it so uh you kind of hesitated there what about is that outside of D D? Do you like running like the 10 candles or 10 candles? I'll be a GM all the day. What like, about like I other like board games and too? Like, do you like running the story and narrative on those or is it just 10 candles that you like, you know, cause you're almost still a player in 10 candles too, in a way. Yeah. Um, I think if I had a chance, I'd DM more in D and D mm -hmm. it's just, I don't really have a chance and I'd rather you need more deep dive into my characters. <laughs> um, then yeah greg's just uh, honestly it's the greg factor <laughs> like i mean to be fair i've seen that with with pip and mark as well i mean <laughs> having that come in and, and watch that interaction too so yeah that's cool okay that's fair uh, i i think it's so funny because i am a dm twice a week on stream and yet i prefer playing most of the time too yeah um, but i have so many ideas that i want to bring out and try and happen that like i don't know i just there's not enough people DMing that I like yeah. playing with. So I think there's a lot of times that I just end up DMing anyway because it's like, well, I know I'm not going to be the best. I'm going to fall short, but this is a story or like an experience I want to hand out. So that's interesting. I, I love hearing. That's like a question that I think is at first glance so easy for a lot of people, but really has a lot of depth to it and kind of shows like the complexities that people have on doing because, you know, Unless it's like, a, oh, I'm just scared to DM. I don't think a lot of people are that. A lot of people have at least tried to DM. Yeah. It's just it's the different reasons why they, they like it or not. Um, yeah. Like, I love world building. I usually help Greg with his world building oh, and his fun. homebrew game. But, yeah, just not running a game for Greg. <laughs> I sound like an awful wife. Let me tell you. <laughs> He's a delight. But, like... Not for your first time ever. It's the chaos DMing. and the improv, yeah, kind of throws you outside of the the framework yeah. that you're in as a as a new DM. I get that for sure. Yeah. I mean, my first ever homebrew and having to have Zach yell at a god was very much a, huh? This is not going to be a normal character, and I, I got to figure out how to give him a good storyline and handle this. <laughs> so yeah. You're weak. Or like it was even uh, I don't know. Remember when he was trying to get into the dean's office too? He was like, yep, he was yeah, yeah. Like, Who are you, I kid? Love like, yeah, I love. I it. love Zach. I I love it because it stretches my my skills as a DM and, and not just like being like, okay, sure. You know, I'm like, you know, what I mean, like having a no but give a yes out of it. So I think it's so much fun. Um. So what about your favorite moment in a campaign you've played in? Um. Whether it's been, I guess, Greg or someone else you played with. Okay, so I think my favorite moment was OG Brielle, first game I ever played her in. We had just come across like an ogre colony and they were talking to Drow and we overheard their plans about how they were going to attack the town we were kind of working out of. And so we decided to go back and see if we could like meet with the head of the like guard, um, the military kind of guy, and see if he could help out or at least give them a heads up so that they could better arm themselves mm. and so um essentially they walked into his office and he just kind of like rudely greeted them and uh so braille being the delight that she was <laughs> then they told her he was like 
yeah, well, it's it's not happening. It's not a thing. Not under my watch would this happen. And she just takes the ogre head and like throws it on his desk. And she's like, well, I did your job for you. You're welcome. And he's just like standing there like, and the whole time, like the rest of the conversation, she didn't even call him by his name. She just called him pretty boy because wow. he was like that clean cut, polished armor, all that kind of stuff. So she'd be like, sorry, what's that pretty boy? I can't hear you. Do you want to speak up louder? Do you want to maybe have more authority? Are you actually going to do something? And she would just antagonize this man. And he was like, ended up being 20, like the same age as Brielle. So he was definitely like a trust fund baby that was put in a power position. And then at the end of the whole thing, she was just like, all right, like I'm going to actually go do the real work while you stay in here and polish your sword some more. And then just left. Like, I love her. I, I love her love so much. It. Oh, that's amazing. A yeah, I think Avum and Brielle would be good friends. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, man, that's so good. I love it. What about your favorite character, Death to Witness, whether you were it was a character of your own or someone else's PC? Have you, have you so, come across Death a lot in campaigns? Well, I mean, Amara died a thousand times, so... Fair. <laughs> Elf with the Death Wish. But no, I think my favorite game with a character death was our friend's one shot d6 kind of game okay. where it was set in a cyberpunk 80s kind of aesthetic game and greg was playing okay you're gonna be surprised he was playing an android that was literally like an 80s mannequin that could just move like he was made of like he was just falling apart like the most basic of basic. That's amazing. I like, love classic it Classic so Greg much. character. Oh my God. Classic Greg character. And so he was, what was his name? It was like B01331, I don't know, his name was Bobby, but it was spelled with like numbers. Amazing. And That's his- Code name is like the- uh, Yeah. The, um, yeah. Oh, Greg post posted it. And so, so his good. prime directive was to like, like help his master out like whoever his owner was and for some reason he felt the need to have the npc that's like a psychopathic murderer that's literally kind of like holding us hostage and threatening to kill us by getting him us to do his job for him he was wow. like master you're amazing like let me do everything for you so <laughs> <laughs> this P NPC was getting injured and we're in the middle of like this hallway and there's like a shootout. There's like a couch tipped over. We're hiding behind the couch while like people are shooting at us and all that kind of stuff. And Bobby sees a one who was the NPC get injured and starts walking out to try and save him with his like, I don't know, he had like a machine gun and he's <laughs> like going and somehow evaded everything. He was perfectly <laughs> fine until the next turn, which was our friend, and she was playing Stan, the UP USPS mailman. <laughs> and I, uh, we're, we're, we might need to set around and get some more information on this campaign because this sounds amazing. I, yeah. They, someone played a mailman, get stuck in a Yeah, story? so essentially we were all playing <laughs> average people that were kidnapped so and then forced fun. to do these crimes for like a, like a, mafia kind sure. of thing yeah yeah and so if we wanted to live we had to do these crimes like they had collars around their neck that like kind of like they this could just amazing. kill them instantly and so stan the mailman <laughs> was song. one of the characters and so that was our friend's character and she rolled to shoot at some of the bad guys in the hallway well unfortunately she crit failed so absolutely mangled it and so the dm was like okay well like bobby's literally in the middle of the hallway there's no way you're not gonna hit him can you roll for damage Oof. so she rolled for damage and got crit like max damage and just took out bobby oh, like just in gosh. the middle of a firefight just took bobby no. out and he like went down like a champ it was like we were killing ourselves laughing oh, at like if God. he was to go out anyway it would be friendly fire <laughs> like classic Amazing. greg character i love that it not only is it friendly fire it's friendly fire after getting like avoiding every other shot from the enemy right before that yeah, bad guys can't touch him, but the good guys on your team will kill you. So it sounds like you guys have had a great, a lot of experiences of just utter failures. And Oh, uh, yeah. So I was told to 
bring up this question this week. Oh no. Please tell us the story and your side of dying, since we're speaking of that, as a hedgehog. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I will be fair, I was sneaking up to a roof of a house, and I was the only one around. I could see like 20 of these guys. And so Greg was like, you get a sneak attack round. So I was like, perfect, that's awesome. I don't have th that I don't have uh, enough d20s to roll to hit all these guys. Can I borrow your d20s? And everyone just looked at me like, what? And I was like, no, I got like I got I got to hit all these guys. So can I have all your? And they're like, no, you only get to hit one of them in a sneak. And I, and then instantly like my face must have just like got, dropped. And I was like, like oh, realizing I've made some bad the life choices right now. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am like calling out like twenty guys that are all armed with like ranged weapons, and I have a dagger as my only weapon on a rooftop. So as a hedgehog though, right? Oh, well, no, I I got hit, and then as I was falling, they turned me into a hedgehog, so I wouldn't, like, I could, like, <laughs> fall into a window, or it was awful. It was just... No, I need, <sighs> I need this explanation. <laughs> well, I don't remember a lot of it. Greg remembers it, because that's his favorite. Oh, my but, God. But, yeah, like, so they, I remember I was trying to, like, jump, bet jump through a window <laughs> to try and save myself, so then, like, I broke the window... And then I remember at one point oh, they man. just turned me into a hedgehog. Uh, oh no, they turned you into a hedgehog by hitting you with a million. Oh, yeah. So it was, it was just a. Uh, yeah, I, I was a porcupine. That's Because I got hit with a lot of stuff. <laughs> and then I died. <laughs> Classic Amara style. That's a glorious way to go out, though, I will have to say. I think. Yeah. I mean, my, my character deaths have been. Ambro getting uh, eaten by a vampire, so getting turned into one, and then yep. Renan being caught by a, some sort of ooze monster that landed on him while he was sleeping. So, yeah. Every time I join a beacon stream, Renan dies. I feel so bad. Yeah, you're not allowed there anymore. <laughs> yeah, although the car trunk jokes were hilarious. They were really good, though. Renan yeah. almost died. He could have died again this week. It was down to oh, like, no. a reading of a, a, a rules spell that he could have died. So Wow. He's... And little teaser here. As much as Renan dies, I'm, I think my next campaign character could have a chance to die more. <laughs> oh, no. I'm just going to out there we'll oh, see no uh so little beacons or uh uh future tagline there um so uh, kind of transitioning then into this campaign we've talked about who uh you're playing and all this kind of stuff and this is your hopefully your one of your first times completing a full campaign from start to finish um yep. obviously i mean you wouldn't be here if you're not excited about playing that the deep with me but specifically uh what are you looking forward to playing in this campaign specifically like Netta Deep. Um, I'm excited to kind of experience the critical role world that I kind of knew from campaign one because I didn't watch campaign two or three so all my knowledge is just for one mm. but like I'm also just really excited about like how our characters are intertwined with each other and like figuring that out and then like I don't know. I just love Nick and Brittany so much too that I'm so excited to finally like play a game with them. So I'm excited for that's that what chaos. I'm most excited for. Yeah, forget about the story. You guys don't have to worry about the main story. Just yeah. focus on each other. Yeah. No. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. So that's the second one. So what is your exposure to Critical Role? I think we've kind of hinted towards it, but um, like your official campaign one. one. Campaign one. And so that's... yeah, we. Go ahead. I was gonna say we started watching it early too. Like mm. I think we like started watching episode four. Oh wow! Like live, okay. like we were really early on in it because nice. that's when we kind of found D, D and Diesel. Yeah, and so yeah, they kind we of just started were, watching like, right next to each other with the promotion yeah. going live. Mm -hmm. So I remember like back in the day when they just do streams and have like play like just dance afterwards and stuff my like favorite that favorite stuff yeah or right? like opening up gifts afterwards and or i can't chatting. remember his name but the guy that used to like run their tech for them that yeah. like played what was his name uh, uh he was like the demon lord fluffy or something like that and he had like the unicorn onesie i know you're played. talking about he was hilarious exactly so like, like it was like brian yeah. foster before brian foster but he was more yeah. like the tech guy as well yeah yeah so i remember that like so that's kind of my knowledge of critical role and Primo critical i think role, in my opinion yeah 
yeah it was my favorite so that's so fun yeah because um that's about when i came in i think i was about 15 episodes late because instead of watching live right away i just focused on catching up in on youtube so i think i got caught up within a week or two like fully caught up and then watched live yeah we binge watched it too and i almost want to say i think one of my first ones was no spoilers but uh i'm gonna say vex and the armor scene oh yeah so going into that live and having that be like the first time i've ever like cried over D D, watching other people cry i was like Oh, there's something to this like that's what i want not like the the D D i've experienced at like my adventures league table or around the table yeah that's fun that's super cool um well that's actually how i got my name amara vaxelin was because vax was my favorite character yep. in the first campaign and so i was like all right well i'm playing an elven rogue i'm just gonna slip vax in her name there to like be a nod to him so i had um I forget her first name, but it was something Vexalia because of that yeah. same thing. Um, and I think it started with a V and that's where Viri came from. Was okay. Because I took that same character from that game. We, My friend was doing a um, Legend of Dragoon game that he kind of put into a 5e setting. And so she was like that street urchin sort of like dagger girl. And then I, I took that concept brought her to Star Wars. So yeah, same here was like that, the Vaxelin, Vaxalia sort of inspiration. Yeah. Which I think is so cool. Like, I think it's something we, like I've never talked about with you guys. I know we're both like kind of Critter fans, but it sounds like you, me, and Greg kind of all had the same kind of story getting into D&D. &D yeah. In way. So that's why I like these interviews so much. I don't think I would have ever guessed that, that... D, D Diesel is what got us into Vin it. Diesel of all people. Of all like... people as to do with all this. I think it's just so funny to me how that happens. And and I'm excited to, to get a chance to play with you guys at the table and how that will play out too. So Yeah. Um, and don't worry, again, everyone else kind of reiterating, uh, even though this is a critical role setting, um, our you know, we we do have a lot of people that aren't familiar with a lot of lore. One of our players who knows nothing about the lore. Uh, so I'm not going to make this a oh, very little, very critter heavy one as well. So um, if I get things wrong, bear with me. It's my world. It's not you know, necessarily Mercer's. So that's okay. You know, like we're, we're taking our version of it and creating our own stories. So um, so what about your process for character creation? I know you're, the, the, the process of naming your character was a little weird this time. Uh, but what is your normal process for character creations? Um, is it inside out? Is it mechanics first? Is it an idea? Uh, how, how does walk us through uh, Megan's process of character creation? I usually will start with a person, like just an idea of a person. So my best example is always Brielle. Mm -hmm. So with Brielle, I literally, my only thought was, I want to be a blacksmith. Like that was it. Oh, and I built a whole character off of that. So I was like, okay, well, why would a blacksmith be an adventurer? Okay, so Greg's character screwed over my character, and she's trying to get her family's, like, business back. Okay, sure. So then I was like, okay, so mechanically, what class gives me blacksmithing? Because I can't be a blacksmith and not know how to blacksmith. And at the time, the only thing, because Rune Knight wasn't out, right. the only thing was a forge cleric. And I was like... Okay, I'll be a forge cleric, but she's not religious. Yeah. So how can I play a non-religious cleric? That makes absolutely no sense. And I was like, well, maybe if I play an Asimar, then that's kind of how her religion ties into it. She doesn't know she's religious, but she has celestial powers within her. So that's kind of how I picked that, right? So it's just like kind of how I pick a character. I'll pick an idea of what I want this person to be and then I'll pick a race and a class that fit within that narrative kind of thing. That's fine. Um, but I'll never pick like, I want to be a tiefling or I want to be a paladin. That's just not how I do it. I can't. So you, you I, even if you want to go like a certain route, you will never go class first and create the story around that? No, That's like even when I multi-class, I multi-class around the story. Yeah. So I don't know what I'm going to multi-class as. Like Brielle ended up multi-classing into Rune Knight when mm -hmm. it became out. And then a uh, close character that she was close to died. And she became a paladin be of his god right. sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. 
they had like interactions with that god and things. So I don't know. I just the story has to make sense, and then I put mechanics to it. Okay. I'm excited to see how that might interact and factor into your character here. That'll be really interesting. I'm actually blanking out what class you're playing. That's <laughs> <laughs> the, we'll, the, we'll one of the two classes life. I said I'd never play. That's fun. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I'm trying to throw it back. I know it's all in my notes. I think we've talked so much about your story because I think that's like you said, the identity is around the story. That um, That's funny. The mechanics have already bled away from me. That's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then what about your inspirations to use to get some of those ideas? Is it mainly from games, music, movies, books? Like what, what kind of helps stir those like, oh, I want to be a blacksmith or I have this character idea and like, what's, what do you pull from with that? Or is it just stuff that comes to your mind that you're like, oh, I want to do this? Uh, most of the time it's just, I feel like doing this, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but like folklore plays a big thing into how I create characters. I love different religions and things like that, that'll play into it. So pulling from there and then making it make sense. Like I have a changeling character, but she's not a D&D 5e changeling. She's like a like a doppelganger monster changeling. Like she, in her normal form, it looks almost like mud and clay. She's not that pretty like yeah. alien-y kind of white with the black eyes around, that kind of thing. So um, that kind of leans into like my absolute love of the Witcher and that kind of Slavic folklore. So nice. uh, things like that play into it. I'd say The Witcher out of any game has the most bearing on my characters, but to be, I'm a history nerd. I took history and I took old English. Like it's just where my interests lie is history and medieval period and Renaissance and all that kind of stuff. So I usually take a lot of historical references. Nice, okay, that's fun. I mean, um, do you take them from fantasy lore or real life like do you take a lot of your inspirations from like real life um because you talk about religions or maybe even cultures and try and put that into a fantasy version or is it oh for version? sure okay for sure I yeah so like for, yeah my changeling is heavily based in polish um mm. like her outfit is polish embroidery um she's has two main like she has a male persona and a female persona and so like oh, one of them is like very based in like the cultural outfit of like polish women but then the other one is like a cossack so uh that kind of history to that oh, fun. so yeah like i pull from real life into that oh, that's really cool i really like that um so then without going into too much specific detail how did you come up with the character you're playing here, uh, Selena? I'm, I'm gonna get that wrong. Uh, Selenia. Selenia. Yeah. You guys know me and names. Never gonna get it right. <laughs> Selenia. Um, literally, I had an idea. I was like, I, and I can't tell you the idea because it's like the whole so her whole shtick. It. Yeah. Her whole shtick. But I had this idea when I was standing, believe it or not, in a lineup to get into Home Depot during COVID. And I was just like, wouldn't this be a cool idea? And then Greg was like, that is a cool idea. And I was like, what would I pick though to make this work? And then I realized, I was like, this is one of the classes I said I would never ever play because it had no interest to me, but it made perfect sense. And that's what I mean when I say yeah. I make the character that I pick the traits afterwards I for like mechanics. That. I mean, it makes sense because like, I think that, that makes a lot of sense because I know for me, I will, there'll be certain classes I'll be like, I'll never pick that until, like you said, I have that interest to do it because of the character. And they'll be like, well, actually, this would make sense for the character. I guess I'll go this way. And then that's how I sometimes I'll find out I actually do like a class or don't like it doing that way. Yeah. That's how it was with me and Rogue for the longest time. My best friend always played a Rogue. Like, no matter what, I'm like, dude, play something different. And he's like, no, man, I'm a shadow no. Rogue. Like, hooded. <laughs> stereotypical edgelord. edgelord i steal everything rogue and i'm like i will never play a rogue and i think i've played like three rogues back to back right now like <laughs> just because yeah. you know I, you know i have to granted they're all multi-class but that's okay um and that's, well, actually, and that's the thing with okay. my character because i was gonna say everyone always that i play with that plays this is always an edgelord and i was like no thanks not for me let's do something fun and happy yeah <laughs> and it was like what <laughs> yeah i i'm i'm huge on taking the regular lore concepts or the expected concepts of a class. I'm like, oh, this is what he'll be like. I'm like, mm, nah, I'm playing a scaredy cat paladin. You know, like that's yep. 
What? Like he's Australian. charismatic. He should his his confidence comes from his his confidence in his oath. I'm like, nah, nah, he'll get there eventually. So yeah, there's growth. Yeah, I love it so much. It's so much fun. Or like, um, I've been going through a character I'm developing now, and I I can tell I'm I'm apparently really stretching the bounds of I think expectations on it because everyone's like huh like you're you want to do what with it and i'm like it works i'm pretty sure it works just just like let me let me pull you through my thought process and everyone's Trust like the process. I, I guess Trust the process. yeah so and then eventually people are like okay i can kind of see it now like i need to see it in action but i'm like okay okay good <laughs> that's really fun um i was gonna add in another question too because i am notorious for just not being able to go straight class how are you with playing straight classes or multi-classing? I've never played a straight class ever. Yes. <laughs> Multi-class all the way, and I will never take an ASI. All the feats. Give me all Interesting. the Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm normally Drives like that nuts. too, but a lot of my DMs lately have been making me do like low rolls, <laughs> so sometimes I don't have the opportunity to do that, but yeah, I'm the same no, way. I, yeah. I lay into those low rolls. I love them, so... Yeah, I'm like, this is what I'm stuck with. Unless I get a magic item, that's it. Like, or if a feat yes. can bump it up by one. So, yeah, right. no, I don't... This might be the first character I play that's single, but I'm pretty sure I already have in my head that I'm multi-classing them. <laughs> like, I'm, like, 98% yeah. sure I know what their multi-class is nice. going to be. Nice, nice. That'll be fun. That'll be really fun to see, like you said, how the story interacts and guides your character with that. Because yeah, and now with the rivals coming into this, I think it's so interesting how the rivals could have changes on the course of your of your characters. I'm yeah. someone very much. I think anyone that knows me with my Star Wars game or even Renan to an extent, I'll I usually give them enough wiggle room where it's like how people interact with my character change who they are. And, like, even my expectations for Viri in Star Wars was this way. I thought she was going to become, like, a Sith, dark, you know, sort of, like, gray Jedi. And because of Rachel and these other characters, they, like, pulled her back. So I'm really interested in the rivals, how they would play. Because um, I know for me, they would 100% affect my character, how they would play. So um, I'm definitely interested to see how you guys uh, might do it. This would be, this would be really fun. Um, well, perfect. I think we'll go ahead and end it on that note with one last again no spoilers but give us a teaser of your character an accent a hint something small to whet the appetite of those that cannot wait to see selena uh selenia selenia i'm never gonna get that right <laughs> it's okay i'm oh so sorry gosh. i i well it's because like um was it Sel selena's from what Sa not sailor moon right Serena is Sailor Moon. Serena, maybe that's Selena maybe, was I think, a famous mu musician. musician. I think that's what I'm Popstar. getting stuck on is Serena and Selena that way. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but anyways, um, why don't you give us a little, give us a little teaser of, of your character? What's something? I don't have an accent yet, but she's very demure. She is very opposite of what Brielle ever is. <laughs> like I literally have gone from one extreme to the other. Um, I will say, don't let her looks fool you, because she's more than she seems. And I will also say, this is the first character I have ever made in the history of ever that is going to wear a dress. <gasps> and that's a big thing. Shook that's it. a big thing. Because it makes no Shook sense it. logically to me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it Why makes sense for her. Why explain that Because I've heard this argument before from you. <laughs> but... Okay, if you are running through a forest, okay, if you're in a, like, uh, modern, uh, not modern, but like a, a campaign in a city, fine. Wear a dress, look cute, whatever. But if I'm running through a forest, getting like knee deep in muck and like elbow deep in monster guts, I'm not wearing a cute little dress. It's just not a thing. It makes no sense to me logistically. My head can't wrap it around. It would be torn and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of decided to make this character as a joke because Rachel I always tell Rachel this so I'm like I'll never make a character wearing a dress so that's kind of like my little like nod to Rachel but also like it just makes sense for this character it does so much I, I will have to say with all your little hints and teases I'm like I'm, I'm so excited to, to yeah. have this come to light and 
the way you're going to do it. Uh, I'm super yeah. excited because I've even seen your sketch on it too, which I think plays yep. plays into it really well. I'm excited. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming on. I I am seriously so excited to to have you at the table. I've played with you at the Garcon one shot. We've no well, we played the Fates uh, one shot too. I keep forgetting about that. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so I'm so excited to have you come for an extended seat at the table. Is there anything else you want to discuss or talk about before we uh, transition out? I think we've hit everything without giving spoilers. That's the problem. I know, My character's very so spoiler there. heavy, so... I think I really want to come back to do this after, like, maybe each chapter in the game and maybe do a night where we sit down and talk about our characters and what's going on. Um, because I feel like there's so much interaction with the characters. There's so much there. And then once we can talk about it, I think there'd be a lot of uh, fun insights on like what you guys were thinking about doing it. And then especially seeing like as things get tied together, you guys could talk about that as well. Things that were unexpected yeah. during your during your process. So uh, yeah, we're going to have to start that. The Megan fan club. It's right underneath Pyro Club. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'll be, it'll, be a little, it'll be a little tribute there. I'll uh, start my own merch. <laughs> yeah. What would be your merch? Uh, it would just say Amara. Just Amara? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, that's what I am. I'm fine with it. Or oh. it would be Amara in the Kahu shirt on the shirt. <laughs> yes. I still, I, I'm still in the process of trying to figure out how to make that Kahu shirt work. Like, I, <laughs> I, I'm trying to look around and no one will do like the full shirt. Because I don't no. want just the cutout. I want the yeah. full shirt print and I can't find it anywhere. It's okay, I looked into it too. Did you? Aww. Yeah. I mean, my thing is, they make the shirts. Somebody makes those shirts. So why not be able to print them? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it, it messes with me all the time. Um, so I am stalling a little bit because I do want to go ahead and raid Critical Role tonight. Um, because tonight is the final night of Exandria Unlimited Calamity. Brenda Lee Mulligan has done a fantastic job. DMing, DMing a four-part series on the Calamity. The Calamity is um, the story of how the gods um, had a big war and how the prime deities and betrayer deities kind of came to be and how they were all pushed beyond the veil. Similar to Fates in a way, um, but and where they are standing here, there was um, like the Golden Age back in Critical World's world where wizards ruled the world and had flying cities. Um, but this is kind of a story of how that ended and how you know, Critical Role in the setting now has become like a normal fantasy world. So um, I think it's really relevant to the campaign we're doing. It's nothing that will be, well, there will be direct relevance <laughs> now that I've read through the book and I'm watching this, uh, that there'll be ties to that, but it won't be necessarily like the same story. So I'm really excited uh, for those that do want to go back and understand the lore relevance of when I say a betrayer god and who that is. This is like a perfect uh, little series for that. So just kind of putting that out there. Um, I think they'll go live here in a little bit, but I'm super excited. Yeah. What about Critical Role? I mean, so you started the first one. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is there a certain region of Critical Role that you like the most? So we have Tal'Dorei, which is where like the first campaign happened. Wildmount. Um, and then we kind of have like Jorhas, kind of where our campaign is going to be uh, for the most part it'll be Ankarel and Jorhas are the main two places uh, that we'll interact with so if you have like a certain region in Critical Role like it's always been like oh, I want to play in that region or I want to I know like city names mm -hmm. more than the things but I loved them on because mm -hmm. there's just everything you wanted to do there and then I love Marquette is that where wherever Gilmore's from yeah Marquette. that's where I really yeah I really like that and place that's too. where I think that's where Ankarel is, is the city yeah. that we'll be playing, is is where Gilmore oh, is, good. I think. It, oh, I might have that wrong. I, th I think Ankarel is in Marquette, if I understand that correctly. Yeah. So, yeah, that'll be really fun. That's actually where the campaign will start, even though... Or, so I'm I'm writing in the intro in Ankarel, even though the campaign starts after that. Um, but then you guys will circle back to Ankarel. So that's why I want to establish these NPCs and characters that you'll have. That way... You already have a reason to go back to Ankara. Because <laughs> that was yeah. kind of something I noticed in the book was like if something doesn't happen, you're like the 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 story's supposed to go back to Ankarel, but it's not exactly 
if there's certain things that don't happen, which I don't want to railroad you guys on, I don't want to force you to go back there, but this would be a, a, a reason for me to be like, oh, hey, your patron says this. Oh, hey, we, we've heard about this. So yeah, I'm come back here and look into it type of stuff. So yeah, I'm excited. Nice. It'll be really, 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 really fun. Um, and what about uh, your... How's your um, take on the Puffy Twins and the Puffy Group? <laughs> Agnes and the Sugar High Syndicate as a player having to come in and interact with these people. (laughs) I tried so hard (laughs) and I got so far and in the end it didn't even matter. I was laughing I tried so hard with normal names. (laughs) Greg was doubling down of like oh no we're trolling this we're making this happen. Oh I know. (laughs) And I'm like, great, Rachel and Pip, the two people that don't even typically watch this campaign night. Yeah, just railroaded it. I've put their footprints on it. At least we didn't get the Puffy Twins as their name. (laughs) That that was, that's my dream They are the Puffy Twins, aka the Well, no, like the group, the faction name. name. Yeah, 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 the faction name. I didn't think you The Puffy Party or... Well, Rachel, the problem is, is when that's one of the only suggestions that comes up... (laughs) You kind of have to take the dumb suggestion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, I think it's super fun. So we got the Sugar High Syndicate, aka the Puffy Twins, the Street yeah. Org or Operation trying to go legit with Granny Agnes's divine sins and sweets. I love it. Chaos and Alos, <laughs> Alfred E. Gator. <laughs> I think it'll be fun. Uh, so since I'm, I am stretching for another eight minutes, uh, with these two characters, what sort of personality do you think they should have? Like, what are you expecting? Like, when you look at them, what are, what are you expecting? Well, I mean, Granny, you've nailed with that oh, voice. Of course. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. She, uh, you know, she went too hard into the, uh, the powdered sugar, if you know what I mean, back in the day. <laughs> That's gonna Chaos. mess my voice. My voice is already, like, screwed up every time I do her voice. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Good luck. That's on you. That'll be fun. <laughs> what if chaos? I think might be standoffish. Do you think chaos will not be chaotic? I I feel like it would be like, like ironic. The opposite, if, an ironic name. Okay. If they were not ironic, uh, sorry, if be ironic if they were not chaotic. I'm like. But then it. Al's the like the quirky one, and then they just have no patience for Al. That's kind of what I was I was thinking. Yeah, I was definitely thinking. It seemed like Al is a little bit more of that quirky free loose one and and chaos has that kind of has that look of like you know just trying to yeah you know, stick with that but maybe they got that name because of combat maybe in combat they're just like that's true crazy chaotic i definitely was thinking these these feel like street names to me you know like yeah. when you're like you know you go in and you're like yeah i'm stinky pete and here's big al over here it's like a little short guy like yep I'm, I'm thinking this. The allegations against Al are completely false. <laughs> Fuck. Well, Greg, you're right in here. You're more than happy to, to scoot over and join in this conversation. <laughs> you could just wave. <laughs> nope. He wants nothing to do with this. Well, what about you, Chad? Do you guys have any other questions for there you go. Megan? Hey, Greg. Uh, that you want to ask her before we end tonight's session. Um... So with this one kind of coming in, I know he doesn't have his bow tie on. He's not ready. <laughs> it's true. He doesn't. <laughs> Last week was a lie. He doesn't wear bow ties every day. He's just trying to impress you all. I I mean, he impressed me. He, he, he took my heart there. I, I was, you know, nervous already to do Bardic Brutes. And then a bow tie showed up. I mean, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Give you the vapors. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but no, I'm excited. So, like, what other uh, classes that you haven't played that would be out there that um, I think you still want to play? Um, I think I've pretty much played everything. I'd like to go after the one shot where I played the Blood Hunter. Mm-hmm. That was really interesting to me. So, I'd really so, like to like further develop a character that that class. Uh, Blood see. Hunter's I know one I'll never... I've seen, but I've never had a chance to get to play it. Yeah, no, it was really good. I mean, the one I picked was literally your Witcher. Like, I could not pick that one. <laughs> it's like there's mutagens and everything, and I was like, yeah, this is the thing. I'm but, excited for all these Witcher fans in in our in our group because um, I might be taking some inspirations for, for oh, a nice. character from it. Not, 
I wouldn't say like the full on Witcher aspect, but I could see it like being an off character that maybe was a Witcher or like, you know, has that Witcher vibe, but like put him in a brand new setting sort of thing. So you sent me art inspiration for this character mm -hmm. and I'm like, excited oh, for this character. Like, you would like this. Yeah. <laughs> also, I'll never play a monk, Greg. Rachel, he just copy pasted girl. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> Ah, uh, getting called out. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad thing to copy and paste. Henry Cavill's gonna call me up and just, you know, cease and desist right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> to... <laughs> just T-Rex? All right. I, no. I, I think I might go with that name now uh, <laughs> because of it. I, I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with a monk, Brittany. Just not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, monks, monks on that list that I would love to play. Um, I was very tempted to go monk with this character too that I'm that I'm actually developing. But from what I've read, I kind of got turned off because it seems like that's where everyone goes with the class that I'm thinking about, and that that turns me off too a lot of times. Where I'm like, well, I don't want to do the prototypical build. You know, I want to do something different with it. You know. Um, yeah. So like, I'd love to just play a street brawler, and I know that would work with a monk, but I literally cannot just, I can't, I can't, because monk to me is just in that tiny little, like, bubble of what everyone plays, yeah. and I'm just like, no. Like, I just want to be someone that, like, Irish street boxes punches you in the face when you say the wrong thing to her. Like, I that's that's probably one of my biggest gripes with D&D, &D, and that's why I liked Animal Beyond Fantasy, is... There was a way to turn, it was a key based brawler, but you could make a brawler work. Like martial arts were a bigger thing. And that is one thing I feel about this is like, I feel like monks are like, like you said, they're, they're that very defined class. And I, I just don't feel like a brawler really fits a monk. But yeah. you can, I mean, that's like, I mean, well, that's the only way to get closest to a brawler in this game. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm. I'm stretching things to figure that out. So I, because I, <laughs> I personally want to play a brawler as well. I think I think mm -hmm. the aesthetic of it, the idea of it is so cool, and to make it actually work in a D and D world, I think it would be fun without it being like too much of a joke character as well. You know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to give away too much because this is Nether Deep and not other stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all. We're all together. We're all the same group yeah, of people. Yeah, it's you know we'll, we'll, we'll tease different stuff. Yeah, no, it's been on my mind a lot lately, so it'll be interesting. I'm, I was tempted to maybe even build an NPC to see how it might work here, if that makes sense. You know. Yeah. Uh, fighter with the brawler feet. Potentially, um, I just feel like it's. I don't feel like that scales nearly as well. And I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a way to get to the flavor of a character, but I, I feel like the brawler feat is pretty lackluster compared. Yep. Um, like it just doesn't do as much when you get into it, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Um, Drunken master and brawler feat. Yeah. I, and that's, I think that's probably the closest way to doing it in monk or with, with D and D. Um, but monk has such a, like a, it's still attached to your key, right? It has that very like monastic feel to it. And I would rather like a monk subclass that gets away from key and goes more of the fighter um, aspects. Yes. Like if it's you... the key that throws me off, right? Yeah. With one level of bar for unarmed defense. Interesting. So just play a strength based monk. If you roll well, it doesn't even hurt. <laughs> That would be interesting. I, I don't know. It, it would definitely be something. I, I have an idea of how to, to bring it out. And it will be interested to see if it does work. Uh, and how people will view it with the way it's played. So I, I'm interested to see um, how, how it will sort of play out there. But um, any other classes that you... What, what What's your favorite class that you played then? Like What's like your go-to that you're like, Ah, I should try and get away from this because I always play it. Uh, Usually fighter. Is a fighter, and I never thought I never thought I'd be a fighter because, like, for me, like I love rogues, like thematically, but I I like to hit stuff. Like I'm really docile, but like man, you get me in D and D, I just want to punch stuff mm -hmm. and hit stuff. Like the violence comes out, <laughs> which sounds horrible, but like with a fighter, I get that in combat versus like spellcasters where I'm like pew or pew. Like, if you miss with a spell, it's the most like 
just deflating thing ever. Right? If you miss with a sword, you're like, okay, cool, we're back and forth. Like it's yeah, like you know, yeah, I got like I can do a bonus attack, or I can like next turn. Guess what? I didn't lose my sword. I'm still useful. But so yeah, I just like to uh, hit stuff. So fighter ranger, I love Gloomstock Ranger. You guys know we talk. I talk about it all the time. Gloomstalker Ranger Stalker is my Ranger jam. Is so much fun. Yep, and Rune Knight is, they're my two favorites of I've, all time. Did you do Gloomstalk and Rune Knight together with Brielle? Not together, no. My Gloomstalker mm. is my Changeling Mia. That'd be an interesting and then, combination, I think. That would be. And then it's like, how do you grow big, but then stay in the shadows? <laughs> well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to go big, but imagine yeah. just a... Yeah, that'd be crazy. Now, Greg's standing now. Greg's beside me, laughing and thinking about this, and he's I guarantee he's already. Corner. Yeah. Yeah, he's probably already thought of a new character. Like, give him two seconds, and he can make a new or character. Or just like a small easily. gnome, or like a small character that grows bigger, <laughs> and oh, yeah. still not that big, just still in the shadows. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Gloomstalker, I absolutely love. It'd be fun. What I are mean... you excited for for another deep? What, what, what's your one thing you're most excited for? Um. I think, A, I just love going, like you said, going into the backstories and having them kind of get flushed out in a new setting. I love Critical World's setting um, a lot, but I, I think this time I'm really excited of this interaction with NPCs, like the rival group. I think this gives a different stakes to the game. And and you might not, you guys might not as a, as a group play it that way, but the way I'm imagining is normally it's like when you get a rival group, it's like, oh, well, we'll just kill them, get them out of the way. I'm hoping that me as a DM will do a good enough job to give you guys pause, even if you guys are turned against each other, of being like, but I get why they're doing that, right? Yeah. Or like, but I've, I've interacted with them, like, I've known them for so long, are we really trying to kill each other right here? You know, and, and maybe the rivals have that same confliction too, so I'm interested to see how it goes. I am also curious with... With Greg and Nick, sometimes their characters are uh, can be quite conniving or quite like straight to the the bullet, so to speak. With a, like you know, like with um, uh, like uh, uh, Autumn, not Amara. Or uh, a woman. So I am interested to see if it will just be end up kind of being a group where you guys are like, nope, we're just gonna get out of our way or we'll kill you, sort of thing. Um, yeah. But I, my character won't. <laughs> I'm interested. I'm, I'm really interested. <laughs> Uh, Cause I was actually thinking about it with like our beacon babies group. Like I was like, man, this would be a very interesting, like back and forth between the characters with that sort of like, with those sort of characters, but it doesn't have to be made in that way. So I think it'd be really cool. I made a rival group in my second campaign and the party just adopted, tried to date them. <laughs> That's literally That's what happens. It's literally in the book of Nether Deep where NPC. it's like, you know, they were interviewing, they're like, hey, if you guys want to try and date them, like it's built into some of the stories that like some of them are looking for romance. So, you know, if you're that kind of party that likes to romance in the game, like there you go, you know. <laughs> I just think it's I think it's really cool. I just think the the possibilities that it opens up um is really loud. And you know what I just realized? Because I'm a dingus, tonight's Wednesday. <laughs> oh, so we've just been chilling it's here not, for 15 minutes. Yeah, what? Uh, it happens. Critical Role come on posting all this stuff today, so and I'm usually off on Thursdays. That um, that's funny. Anyways, I've enjoyed just uh, hanging out and chatting with you. Um, yeah. But that being said, let's go ahead and now that I don't need to stretch it out that much longer, um, we'll go ahead and raid a uh, careful cantrip. How's that? Nice. So we'll put that out there. Thank you guys again so much uh for just supporting us and coming out especially for supporting megan and everything thanks guys raid them anyways yeah we'll just go say critical role just, just 11 people <laughs> chilling in there a repeat careful can't trip. all right uh and next week we'll be back here i think oh man i gotta go look at my schedule is it i think britney's next or is it nick i don't Give me know a second. let me go back and look because i i forget who's next actually See if I can find it in yeah here. I got a schedule there somewhere. Actually, I don't know if we figured it out. <laughs> uh, uh, you just I thought we just figured out Greg and I. Yeah, we haven't figured it out Doesn't yet. Doesn't matter, so, they're both awesome. Surprise, you'll get a surprise next week, whether it be uh Sassy Fire or PITV Studios. 
uh, on our interview next week. So I'm super excited. Thank you guys so much uh, for bringing this out. We'll um, potentially do, I'm thinking about creating Granny's Sweet Treats shop next week and their faction hideout. Uh, that way it gives you guys like a place to go to and, and maybe make some of those maps. Uh, so I think it'll be really fun. Um, perfect. Guide the raid. Guide the raid. I mean, you know what? We got to honor. We got to honor. I, I almost pressed start raid. So yeah, sorry. Careful cantrip. This is why we run things on Wednesday nights. They're usually busy. I don't even think I can. I even raid them when they're not live. I don't think you can. I don't think I can. Unless it's a rerun. Nope. Oh, it allows there you me. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. As we will go raid Critical Role. Thank you guys so much. Uh, to definitely check out uh, Face United tomorrow at 7:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when we get back with in our game. We have Sunday Beacon's Aura, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Marquee Gaming. And then we'll be back next Wednesday to continue our road to the nether deep here on Bardic Brews. I love you guys. And as always, show your love and respect to anyone that's hanging out in the Critical Role chat. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Do people do that? Yeah, they actually think some do. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>